It is with the greatest pleasure that I introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Kevin Kit Parker. Kit Parker is the Tarr Family Professor of Bioengineering and Applied Physics in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard University. He is a primary faculty member of both the Harvard Stem Cell Institute and the Wyss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering, and is also a member of the Systems Biology Program at Harvard Medical School and the Harvard-MIT Health Science and Technology Program. He received his PhD in Applied Physics in 1998 from Vanderbilt University, his Master's of Science in Mechanical Engineering in 1993 from Vanderbilt University, and his BS in Biomedical Engineering in 1989 from Boston University. He is currently a member of the Defense Science Research Council, an advisory activity to the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, called DARPA, and has recently served on the Defense Science Board Task Force on Autonomy. In addition to his teaching responsibilities at Harvard, Kit Parker is the director of the SEIS, or the School of Engineering and Applied Science Disease Biophysics Group, which researches, focuses on organ, organ development and the function, functional implications of biological form and how the coupling between form and function goes awry during disease. He's involved in projects ranging from creating organs on a chip to developing nanofabrics for applications in tissue regeneration, and he is currently helping develop a heart lung micro machine that will accelerate drug safety and efficacy testing. Before reading the second half of his bio, or the second part of his bio, a few personal comments. I have known Kit Parker since he was a student here back in 1989. 25 years ago, he graduated. I knew him when I taught him in controls and I taught him in senior design projects. And I've kept up with him ever since. He's now a colleague. But when I first met him as a student, he came across to me as someone with astonishing, overwhelming leadership skills and a grade point average that no parent would be proud of. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> so those of you in the bottom half of your class, where he was well into, Consider what I just read as the first part of his biography. But he's more than that. Kit Parker is an infantry major in the United States Army Reserve component and has served two combat tours in Afghanistan, where he was awarded the Bronze Star, the Army Commendation Medal with a V device, and the Combat Infantryman's Badge. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Kit Parker. That's quite an introduction. Um, so if you're near the bottom of the class, um, you're of my tribe. Um, I got through with the, by the skin of my teeth. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think it was like about just a couple days before graduation, I was begging the late Mo Waterman to pass me in my electronics class. And one of the things I promised to him was that I would never build circuits because <laughs> It, it occurred to me that he might be very concerned about his obligation to society not to turn me loose out there <laughs> dealing with electricity. So um, this morning as I was getting up and getting dressed and I was trying to pick out a shirt that Professor Colburn would wear. Um, <laughs> I started thinking about when I graduated and who the commencement speakers were for the College of Engineering. And I didn't have a clue. You're not gonna remember a thing I said. <laughs> it might be on YouTube someday. If you even remember that you were here, you can go back and watch it. <laughs> and you're probably thinking, how did this guy get picked? And just imagine this, imagine a meeting. Dean Luchin is running the meeting and he sits down and he says, all right, we gotta have a commencement speaker. And the first criteria he asked, who's alive? <laughs> that narrows the field pretty quickly. So when I was trying to think about why did I get picked, um, I realized why. 
I'm free. I knew where to park. And I always show up. And I started thinking about the comments that I had prepared for today and rehearsed with my niece Parker and my daughter Caroline last night. And I realized that nothing I said or rehearsed was going to be better advice than be cheap, know where to park, always show up. <laughs> I, I, I really don't have anything else to say. <laughs> But I'm returning to the scene of the crime about 25 years after I graduated. And the great thing about being, well, what you're going to learn is why I'm so cheap, right? Um, and you never get invited back again after you give a talk like I'm going to give. So I'm going <laughs> to share with you a, a couple of comments. And I want to build on the student speaker's comments because I thought they were, they were right on. Uh, I'm an engineer. I'm a Boston University trained engineer, um, a societal engineer. And my job isn't always technical, but it always involves solving problems. And in the last dozen years or so, I've worked on some really tough problems where I've been witness to some tough problems. A war on terrorism, diseases that kill children, poverty and despair in the streets and villages of American, America and Afghanistan that just sucked the life um, out of somebody. Death, dismemberment, poor education, prison. I've seen an intelligence community whose failure to properly apply the scientific method, because you should apply the scientific method whenever you ask a question, has resulted in increased incidents of terrorism around the world and a challenge to your civil liberties. I've seen an industry, a medical industry, with a lack of innovative courage. And because of that, we've seen a reduction in the number of available cures to people who are ill an increase in their price, lost jobs, and public contempt and distrust. I've seen a model of warfare, counterinsurgency, where no one thought to think about doing any research into the fundamental challenge you face in counterinsurgency, and that's how to make a friend. I've seen an industry stand up promising to help in the aid to search for cures and to offer cures themselves that never thought about developing quality control so they could check their work. And I've seen a disease, traumatic brain injury, my awareness of this came on the battlefields of Afghanistan, that still exists in the academic backwater because of the lack of an effective lobbyist in Washington. So I've seen a lot of problems. I've dealt with a lot of problems. And when I've turned and looked at these problems, I usually don't need a microphone. I'm usually with your demographic, that 18 to 30-year-old demographic. I've been in the lab with you. I've fought beside you. I've taught you in the classroom. I've mentored you. I've slept in the dirt with you in Afghanistan. I've shared your triumphs. And I've stood beside you and cried when one of you died. So I, th I think I know you a little bit. And I think I know the conditions under which you do your best. And the great thing about you between 18 and 30 years of age is you don't know where the bodies are buried. That's why so much innovation comes from your demographic, because you don't know what can't be done or what shouldn't be done. So I want to talk about engineering problem solving, because whether or not you ever practice as an engineer, if you go to law school, if you go to medical school, if you're a Pilates instructor on some cruise line, hopefully your education has instilled in you this instinct to solve problems. And society is going to come to you, and they're going to dump some pretty jacked up situations in your lap. And you're going to have to think through them. You're going to have to solve those problems. And part of your, your job here at, at Boston University was to prepare for that, to prepare for these problems that you're going to face. And a lot of what you're going to face is just stupid. Now, stupid is a bad word. We teach my daughter Caroline not to say the word stupid. But people aren't stupid. Their behavior can be stupid. Technology can be stupid. The situations where they're combined can most definitely be stupid. <laughs> Policy can be stupid. Your job is to find stupid and get rid of it, whether or not you wear the job title of engineer or not. It's not tidy. The great thing for you people at the bottom of the class 
is that all the time you spend at T's Pub and the dugout studying human behavior. <laughs> in the professional environment is gonna put you on equal footing for those of you who spend a lot of time doing your homework and thinking about inside the box solutions. The problems are gonna be pretty ugly you're gonna face and they're gonna be equal parts human as they are technical. As a matter of fact, a lot of the scientific problems I've dealt with over the last dozen years or so, or maybe since you were in middle school, the technical prop part, component of the problem was drowned out by the human component. Stupid hurts. If you endeavor to, challenge, to go after the really difficult problems that society has, you're gonna see problems at the frontiers of knowledge and at the extreme of the human condition. You're gonna see unfathomable agony in the face of an incalculable technical solution. You've got to prepare yourself for that. It's gonna challenge you as much physically and spiritually as it is mentally. These problems are probably gonna come close to breaking you before you break them. And you have to prepare yourself. This is why you do more than just take classes. This is why you go to T's Pub. This is why you go to the dugout. This is why you participate in extracurricular events or college athletics. I oftentimes envy the athletic coaches because they have a student for four years, and you can really mold someone in four years. In a semester class where I've got you for three lecture hours a week, I, I can't do that. I can't mold you that way. Hopefully this environment at Boston University, an environment that I'm really proud of, and I was taking my niece around yesterday and, and I was taking a look at BU, and I was really struck by how proud I was to have had this experience, and hopefully you will be too, but, all of the experience, not just your classroom experience, is going to be preparing you for what you're about to face. Do not be afraid of the cutting edge. And I'm going to tell you something. When you have to go somewhere where there's nothing and you have to make something, some third world rat hole where you've got to go in there and build a well, build a school, try to get tribes to, to make nice with each other, when you go into a laboratory and you face a disease that kills people and there's no one working on it. Think about what happened with HIV several years ago. We got in the game a little bit late on that one. There was nothing. And it took a long time to inspire people to go in there and make something. You have to get over this fear of facing the unknown. You have to show this perseverance that's required for the long fight. And that's what you're facing, a long fight. When you prepare to innovate, it's as much a state of mind and strength of character. The script for your life or your role as an innovator was largely written before you came here to Boston University. The ability to connect the dots, the ability to lead, the ability to organize, a lot of this came from, from your families or from your upbringing. Boston University was designed just to help give you some subject matter expertise and some experiences to continue to kind of polish you and prepare you for those challenges. But if I could leave you with a list of things that uh, I think you should do if you're your demographic, and I, most of these things, I still do at 48 years of age, uh, I'm gonna leave you with five things. And I'm not stupid enough to think that you're writing these things down. <laughs> That's why there's YouTube. At 48 years of age, I still have mentors still have mentors who in word and deed help me from creating more stupid than I try to mitigate. That's really important. And you're gonna find the role, of, uh, the role of mentors has been very important throughout your career, different mentors for different things. You need to get out and learn how to be a good team member and how to build and lead teams. Innovation is not an individual trait. It's the emergent property of a good team. And if you don't build teams, you're never gonna be able to address those really challenging problems that exist at the interface between different fields. I'll tell you a story. When I went to Children's Hospital to do a postdoc um, after my PhD, I remember I got off the elevator the first day. I was going to work with Don Ingber, and he was uh, in the empire of Judah Folkman, the great cancer researcher who studied angiogenesis. And when the elevator door opened on the Enders building over there at Children's Hospital, there was this huge picture on the wall, and it had a headshot. 
of every one of Dr. Folkman's trainees who were a member of the National Academy. So first of all, it said, hey, power, look at whose house you're in. But if you knew Dr. Folkman, you knew that cultivating the careers of his people on this team was really important. And understand as a team leader, the product you deliver, not just scientific, but in terms of your team members, is just as important. You've got to develop your team. You've got to learn how to call out stupid, but you've got to be aware of the second and third order effects of calling out stupid. I haven't always been that good at it. You have to understand that you've got to call out stupid and you've got to save good people who just found themselves in a stupid situation. That's really important. The other thing you've got to learn how to do is to understand that money is the enemy of ideas. It's the ally of innovation. But I oftentimes see, I saw it on the battlefields of Afghanistan and Iraq, where we used money as a weapon system. You've all seen companies that were very well funded, but failed to innovate. And I see this in my laboratory every day, where young, inexperienced engineers try to buy themselves, buy their way out of a problem rather than think their way out. Money is an enemy to good ideas. Money is an ally only to when you want to innovate and put it in somebody's hands. I'll leave you with one final note. The fifth thing that you've got to do to prepare yourself to solve society's problems is maintain the cultural moorings that define any civil society. Faith, family, and friends are important. I know. I face this challenge myself. But if you live at the edge of ugly long enough, and as a societal engineer, if you're really living up to that title, you're gonna get next to ugly pretty quick. You're gonna get scuffed up. You've got to maintain those bonds with people whose values you want to adopt and strengthen your own and help them strengthen theirs. And as part of that, one of the things you've gotta realize is that every problem you work on has the potential to impact a child, and you need to own that responsibility. So you're probably wondering when this speech is going to be over. It is.